Alright guys, how's it going? We finally have concrete information on RDNA3, after AMD's reveal of their 7900 series of graphics cards. It was a strange event with an unenthusiastic crowd, and I had to turn down the volume due to sheer cringe when the audience applauded weakly to Lisa's announcement of their 61 teraflop 7900XTX. As detailed in my last video, RDNA3 is indeed a chiplet architecture, with a 5 nanometer graphics compute die and either 5 or 6 memory cache dies, with those being on 6 nanometers. I'm not going to go over all that stuff again, so if you don't know what it is, feel free to check out my previous video for the whole details. Also in the previous video, I mentioned that RDNA3's compute unit had changed from RDNA2, with a huge increase in shader count. This made me ponder whether or not the shaders were weaker or stronger than the previous generations. I'll just let you listen to this. Or we've continued with our area efficient unified architecture that shares resources between rendering, AI, and ray tracing to make the most effective use of each transistor. Now, every time I hear the words shares resources, I think about Bulldozer, actually, AMD's failed CPU and how badly that did. The short story here is that Navi 31's 12,288 shaders would not perform anywhere near the level of Navi 21 with that amount of shaders. And look, to be fair, that would have made Navi 31 nearly two and a half times faster at the same clock speed. <laughs> Which is precisely why I erred on the side of caution by assuming reduced performance. In a way, this is pretty similar to NVIDIA's recent teraflop story, where Ampere and now Lovelace never sees anywhere near that performance in gaming, compared to their Turing architecture. Turing had separate FP32 and INT32 paths, whereas Ampere and Lovelace share resources. And according to NVIDIA's own slides, this essentially means that Ampere and Lovelace perform around about 33% less than their teraflops relative to Turing, that is, suggest. None of that actually matters in isolation, however, because GPU performance is a combination of factors, and the number of shaders a GPU has certainly does not tell the whole story. Obviously, clock speeds is another important factor. As I said in my previous video, the rumours of 3 GHz were unbelievable, and they really were unbelievable, almost as unbelievable as so many leakers falling for that same false rumour. However, after the presentation, this slide was leaked, showing architected for 3 GHz. I don't know if this is a fake slide or not, but it looks kind of legit. But anyway, in an interview with PC World, AMD's Frank Azor said, Yeah, so what you should know is, you know, these cards, the, uh, the made by AMD cards that we introduced yesterday, um, these are going to be the least common denominator of clock speeds and of performance and of thermals and power and everything. It only gets better from here. Is this why the leakers got clock speeds so wrong? Did AMD target 3 gigahertz and miss by a mile? Who knows? What we do know, however, is that the reference 7900XTX gets nowhere near 3 gigahertz. A curiosity was revealed with the decoupling of clock speeds. Nvidia did something similar to this like 15, 20 years ago when they also had a separate shader clock. In this case, AMD has increased the front end to 2.5 GHz, while the shader clock is a rather disappointing 2.3 GHz. I'm not saying that because the rumours of 3 GHz plus made it disappointing. I'm saying it because it's below what I would have imagined had I not seen any rumours at all. Why did they decouple the clocks? This is where it gets interesting from an architectural standpoint. Because as you can see, by only dropping 200 megahertz on the shaders, up to 25% power is saved. This will be important later on when I discuss the future cards. Why did they increase the front end clock? That's also interesting, with the simple answer being that It'll help prevent the front end from being a bottleneck on the shaders. AMD's old GCN architecture had a real problem at the front end and was often unable to feed the shaders fast enough. So hopefully AMD has learned something from that and Navi 31's front end isn't a real problem. Now for the part everybody cares about, performance, with Scott Herkelman taking the stage. 
Six initial games shown at native 4K resolution, with four claiming a 50% performance increase, one claiming 60%, and another claiming 70%, was the justification for AMD's claims that the 7900 XTX is up to 70% faster than their current top end 6950 XT. Based on this Reddit rundown of reviews, NVIDIA's 4090 beats the 6950X by 75%. So straight off, it's clear that the 7900XTX will not beat the RTX 4090. I don't think anybody really believed it would. It was just a chance based on what we knew of the shader count and what was rumoured about the clock speeds, which were unfortunately miles off. This is also why I didn't give my opinion on where I thought the 7900XTX would perform because I honestly felt it could be either 20% faster or 20% slower. Which sounds crazy, but without knowing the clock speeds and without knowing how the new compute unit really worked, there was simply no way to know for sure. For now, I am just going to assume that the 7900XTX will be 55% faster than the 6950X, which means the 4090 will likely beat the 7900XTX by around about 20%. That's still gonna see it well clear of the RTX 4080 though, probably by a similar 20% or slightly more. And given that AMD has priced the XTX at 999, I cannot imagine that Nvidia won't drop the price of the 4080, as better ray tracing performance but 20% ish worse raster, while costing 200 bucks more? That's not even gonna convince the most ardent of Nvidia fanboys. And on that ray tracing point, it's clear that AMD aren't making a whole lot of effort there, as their own performance slides show a slightly lower increase in RT performance. So this ray tracing gap will be even wider than what it was in the last generation. And on the pricing that I mentioned, there's yet another oddity with the XT non-X costing $899, $100 less for a cut down chip with 4GB less VRAM, one less MCD, and what the f- is this base clock? Right, the final part of this video will discuss what happens next. As you're well aware, I boldly predicted that AMD wins the next generation, regardless of whether or not they win this one. I had already factored in a loss of 20% to the 4090 in that. If they actually lose by more than 30%, it will be tougher but the odds are still very much in their favour. This is the Navi 31 package, with a 300 square millimetre compute die and six 37 square millimetre MCDs. And Locutsa has annotated the graphics compute die here for clarity. And you can see indeed that the chip is very packed with compute units. Basically, all this green and all this pink. If you remember back to last video, Astronomics said that AMD ditched plans for more cash, including one high Infinity Cash. We also saw during the presentation that AMD made multiple references to 4K and even 8K. My analysis in the previous video was that AMD were clearly not being limited by memory bandwidth, but by shader performance. And this is clearly the case. Another possibility though, is that the front end is being a limiter on the chip. Remember, AMD has clocked it higher for a reason, and that reason is to prevent the shaders from being limited by the front end. So with that, if AMD is going to make a larger Navi 30 chip, the chances are they're gonna need to increase the front end as well. And if you go into MS Paint and just grab all this shader area and the command front end, all of this is about two thirds of the entire die which would make it around about 200 square millimetres. So if AMD want to make a larger Navi 30 GPU with double the shader count and doubled front end, that chip will end up being around 500 square millimetres. They could also increase the memory bus to 512 bit, but I really don't think they will. What's important here, obviously, is that die space is not an issue. Nvidia's Lovelace AD102 is 608 square millimetres. Navi 21 is 520 square millimetres. And at worst, as I said, Navi 30 would be that same kind of size. So what is actually stopping AMD here? 
The only potential issue left is with power requirements. The 7900 XTX is a 355W TBP card. That's typical board power, including the VRAM, etc. And for a mid-range GPU from AMD, this is pretty high on power. So let's have a look at the previous generation Navi 20 series. Navi 22, the Radeon RX 6750 XT. That's got 2560 shaders, a 192-bit memory bus, and 12 gigabytes of VRAM. And AMD gives this card a typical board power of 250 watts. Now looking at Navi 21 and the 6950 XT. That's got 5120 shaders, a 256-bit memory bus, and 16 gigabytes of VRAM. And AMD gives that a typical board power of 335 watts. Think about that. For another 85 watts only, you get double the shader count, a larger memory bus, more infinity cache as well, and 4 gigabytes of extra VRAM too. How is that possible? How can AMD get all of this extra stuff for only 85 watts? Well, one obvious reason is that the clock speeds are lower on the larger GPU. Navi 22 has a base frequency of 2150 MHz, and that's compared to 1890 MHz on Navi 21. And Navi 22's boost frequency goes up to 2600 MHz, while 21's only goes to 2310 MHz. Remember this early slide where AMD showed that they saved up to 25% power by dropping the shader clocks to 2.3 GHz? Well, guess what happens when you drop the shaders to 2 GHz? That probably saves around another 20% power. And that is 20% power saved over all of the shaders. Now obviously, that's going to affect performance. But we're still talking double the amount of shaders for 15% less clock speed over them. You don't need a degree in maths to figure out that the overall performance will still be massively higher. According to Tech Power Up's benchmarks, at 4K, the 6750 XT, Strix OC that is, performs 7.5% faster than the RTX 3060 Ti. If we now look at their 6950 XT reference design review, at 4K, the 6950 XT performs 67% faster than NVIDIA's 3060 Ti. So, the 6950 XT is around 57% higher performance compared to the 6750 XT. And don't forget, that's a reference 6950 XT versus an overclocked 6750 XT. 57% extra performance for only 85 watts extra power. And that's the same architecture, remember. And this story actually gets even better, and I'll tell you why. AMD's new chiplets have another power overhead that we haven't seen before. As Ian Cutrus says, on RDNA 3, when you move data off chip, however you're doing it, you pay a penalty. I alluded to one of those penalties last video when I noted that the latency would be higher because of this. That's simple enough to understand. The chiplets are further away from the main die compared to classic L2 cache but you also pay a power penalty for that. As Ian says, it depends on the tech and on the links between the main graphics chip and the memory chips. And this could be anything between 21 and 84 watts. I'm going to assume 40 watts, but we'll find out the exact number when the cards are reviewed. But basically speaking, when the graphics chip and the memory chips are transferring data, there is a constant 40 watts overhead with the new chiplet approach. It's not going to be quite that, obviously, because on die it also takes power to move data from the chip to the L2, but it's nowhere near 40 watts. What's important here, though, is AMD has already paid for that power in their 7900 XTX budget. This 40 watts of power that I suggest will only increase if you widen the bus. That is to say, if you go up to a 512-bit bus by adding another two memory chiplets, I really don't think AMD needs to do this because, as I've said multiple times now, the 7900XTX is clearly not limited by its memory subsystem. So what about adding more Infinity Cache by going high? 
for me, this is clearly an option that they will take. In a way, AMD can increase the effective bandwidth simply by stacking more memory chips higher instead of wider. This transfer rate of 5.3 terabytes per second remains the same because it's still the same 384-bit memory bus, but the effective bandwidth increases because, obviously, it's much faster to take data from Infinity Cache than it is to travel all the way out to the VRAM, which incidentally will cost at least double and probably closer to three times the power as well. So what I'm suggesting is that next year, AMD will release a 7950 XTX. It will be around 500 square millimeters. It will have double the shader count, double the front end, and probably still keep this same 384 bit wide memory bus, just with one or two high stacked memory chiplets. And what's more, they don't even need to use more power or cost on VRAM because the 7900 XTX is already at 24 gigabytes. And as you've seen by Tech Power Up's numbers, the 7950 XTX, it will be at least 50% faster than the current 7900 XTX at a maximum, what, 100 watts more power? And AMD also has the option of moving to TSMC's 4 nanometers, which as you know, Nvidia is already using, and that will save them a little bit extra power as well. The problem that many people are having with the 7900 XTX is that they think it's AMD's high-end GPU. It's clearly not. And I explained last video that AMD's real high-end would come next year. And after the event, even AMD's own Frank Azor said that the 7970 XTX is a 4080 competitor. And if you look at it as a 4080 competitor, then you begin to see how much better it is. The main die is 70 square millimeters smaller or something compared to AD103. And yet, the XTX should win by at least 20%, if we can believe AMD's benchmarks. But even if you look at the XTX as a 4090 competitor, I mean, sure it loses, but it loses by not a whole lot at half the die size. Yes, I know the memory chiplets are a large part of the area too, but they just don't really count because they're not on the main die. Having this stuff off the main die is a performance drawback. If AMD get another 50-60% to 60 performance on the 7900 XTX, as they did with the 6950 XT, that's going to put them about 30% ahead. Nvidia are already 100 watts more with the 4090, and they've only got 11% shaders left over on the AD102 chip to improve performance. Even with a clock speed bump, the laws of physics says that any 4090 Ti that Nvidia releases will be 15 to 20% faster than the 4090 at best. So when I said AMD wins next generation, I meant it. And I meant it even if they lost by 20% this generation. And I'm sticking to that analysis. So just keep looking out for evidence of a 7950 XT or Navi30, whatever, in the leaks. And then you will know that this is happening. And to be honest, we should all be hoping for this, even the NVIDIA fanboys, because AMD will likely price a 7950 XTX at $1,500, which is still a large increase for them, but it is still cheaper than the 4090 or any 4090 Ti that we will see from NVIDIA next year. If AMD has this chip in the works, they'll have been working on it a good four to six months already. As soon as they got working Navi 31 silicon back from the labs, they'll have been analysing its drawbacks, where to save power and where to improve performance, etc. The only question is, do they actually want to win? Well, the Radeon Technology Group's SVP of Engineering, David Wang, is a winner. He oversaw the 4870 and 5870 eras when ATI last won, and the parallels here should be obvious. With the 4870 just being a little slower than NVIDIA's GTX 280, but the 280 was a massive GPU in comparison. The year after that, ATI released the 5870, and that put the 280 to the sword while NVIDIA was toiling to release Fermi. Wang was a winner at ATI, and he will want to win again. And we all know that Lisa Su is a winner, and it must bug her to see NVIDIA win time and time again. Well, 
this is the easiest chance that RTG has to win in about a decade. And what's more, unlike on 7 nanometers, AMD doesn't have to worry about wafers anywhere near as much because the game consoles are eating 7 nanometer wafers, not 5 nanometer wafers. They literally have no excuses left. Make no mistake about it, this is about desire to win and nothing else. There could be some really fun times in GPU next year. I'll catch you later, guys.